The castaways believed everything was lost, until they suddenly spotted a striking bright yellow object in the middle of the tempestuous tides. As they swam towards the solid surface, floats tied to ribbons measuring a hundred meters showed the direction of the current, easing their struggle. The survivors were downed German airmen sent on a mission to subdue the uncooperative British forces across the English Channel. However, they'd been humbled by an unexpectedly organized Royal Air Force. As they clung to the handrails and climbed onto the Rettingsboje, a rescue buoy, they could see there was an access door to what seemed like a shelter in the middle of the ocean. But as they went inside, they couldn't believe what awaited them. Britain's Next The situation was extremely dire for Great Britain. In less than two months, Germany had invaded and conquered most of Western Europe, overwhelming the Netherlands and Belgium in a matter of days. France had held a little longer, with its 114 divisions and superiority in both tanks and artillery against the fast-moving German army. But the nation was irremediably forced to surrender on June 22, 1940. Adolf Hitler then ordered a strategic pause, expecting Britain to yield and accept a dictated peace on his terms. Even so, the Luftwaffe mounted sporadic bomb raids on southern England and shipping across the Channel. A precondition for the invasion was to establish air superiority. The Luftwaffe was confident that they could defeat the Royal Air Force's fighter command in southern England in just four days, and the rest within a month. Their unopposed victories through continental Europe had made them short-sighted, but the Germans were not the only ones to believe in their military superiority. Famous American aviator Charles A. Lindbergh toured German bases before the war and exclaimed, quote, Germany now has the means of destroying London, Paris, and Prague if she wishes to do so. In truth, Britain was not surprised by the war that suddenly reached its territories and waters. However, the nation was taken aback by how things unfolded and how different they had been compared to World War I. Because of this, the military authorities were not able to plan for such contingencies. Even General Maxime Vega, commander-in-chief of the French military forces until the occupation, proclaimed, quote, In three weeks, England will have her neck wrung like a chicken. An urgent matter. By July of 1940, the Luftwaffe was about twice the size of the Royal Air Force, to which Air Chief Marshal Hugh Dowding exclaimed, quote, Our young men will have to shoot down their young men at a rate of five to one. To make matters worse, now that the Germans had captured strategic regions, including northern France, their aircraft could operate from land merely miles from the British Isles. As such, their potential assaults were significantly more concentrated and within easy range. Given the obvious superiority of the Royal Navy, it was of the utmost importance to the Germans to conquer the airspace above the English Channel and protect Operation Sea Lion. The confrontation was not only fierce, but took a lot longer than initially expected. The Luftwaffe would lose almost 2,000 aircraft per thousand and a half of their counterparts, and hundreds of experienced pilots from both sides perished in the fighting. Some, however, survived the downing and were left at the mercy of the cold, dark waters below. Because of the intrinsic complexity of the process and the added difficulty of operating in a combat zone, the situation called for the urgent optimization of search and rescue efforts. By the beginning of the fall, the Reich Air Ministry commissioned an area of research and project development called the Technisches Amt, or T-Amt, whose primary mission was to work on an emergency solution for castaways. Directed by former aviation ace General Oberst Ernst Udet, the T-Amt eventually presented the Rettingsboje, or rescue buoy. During the next two months, no less than 50 units were built and distributed throughout the channel. Safe Haven the concept was simple, and the Rettingsboje was basically a capsule floating on the ocean's surface. It was either square or hexagonal in shape, and measured 13 square meters. The room inside was 4 by 2 meters high, with a capacity for 4 people. Although it lacked a proper helmet, the platform was topped by a 2 meter turret that extended into a mast, which in turn had white and red light signals that could be seen from roughly a kilometer away. The shelter also had an SOS radio, smoke, and white light flares, 
while a yellow and red striped flag on the mast or a hoisted black anchor ball could signal the presence of people in the buoy during daylight. The buoy was painted in light yellow above the waterline, with red crosses against white oval backgrounds on each side of the turret. Around the outer circumference, both below and above the waterline, tube railings allowed the distressed airmen to cling onto the buoy and climb aboard. A ladder led up to the turret and the opening into the cubicle below. The room was furnished with two double-deck beds, dry clothes and shoes, as well as emergency rations, an alcohol stove to prepare hot food, and a supply of 25 liters of drinking water. There also was adequate cupboard space for first aid equipment. In addition, many sorts of amenities were provided, from cognac and cigarettes to games and playing cards. Notably, there was a supply of stationery for messages. The shelter was powered by storage batteries, but also provided kerosene lamps and other lighting devices in case of breakdown. Plus, its supplies were calculated to last four days, but the rescuers used to check the buoys daily at their given locations. Then, upon the arrival of the rescue ships, the buoys were immediately resupplied. Thanks to the minute devotion of the rescue crews and the practical Rettingsboya, hundreds of aviators managed to survive the harsh seas. ASR While the Germans developed their rescue buoys, the British gave a little thought to the means of retrieving air crews from the seas, and many British pilots had to rely on the German system to survive. In fact, the rate of downed pilots who lost their lives to the seas was about 80%, in contrast to 50% over land. But while there was no organized service, the RAF and several of its boat stations did offer some support, although the system proved deficient with the increase of overwater combat. Initially, fighter pilots were merely provided with a May West life jacket, but after the Battle of Britain, they were given dinghy packs attached to their parachute harnesses. Even so, neither the lifeboat nor the jacket was of much help unless they were promptly rescued and it only got worse during the winter. It was only towards the end of 1941 that air sea rescue flights were first formed, and they were the only rescue vehicles available at the time. While no precise figures are available, and many sources widely differ, there are estimates that thousands of British and later American pilots were saved in the North Atlantic due to such efforts. Furthermore, the British later copied the German buoys and created so-called lobster pots. Notably, the British variants were shaped like a boat's hull, though without an engine or navigation system, making them more suitable and stable for the movement of the tides. With proper training and a healthy dose of good luck, the ASR was able to save hundreds of airmen and deliver them to safety. Impending Danger the Battle of Britain proved the Luftwaffe was not as invincible as it seemed, and one fundamental weakness was its unstable leadership. Even so, the Germans had proven to be fast and furious in short attacks, and their famous Lightning War, or Blitzkrieg, was a solid strategy to sweep continental Europe with the German army and close air support. However, during the Battle of Britain, the Germans came across a first-class opponent for the first time. Goering and his staff had grossly underestimated the Royal Air Force, insisting that the British did not have more than 400 to 500 fighters. In reality, the fighter command had 715 aircraft ready to go, and another 424 in storage, but prepared to serve at a moment's notice. As such, the events of July 10th through October 31st startled both the Germans and the British. The RAF had proved superior to the Luftwaffe in almost every respect, and they ultimately came victorious. But even though the British capabilities were essential to the outcome, the German mistakes sealed their fate. On September 15th, Germany launched an all-out attack with 400 bombers and 700 fighters, but the RAF group shot down 56 and lost only half of that. That was the last time the Luftwaffe would attack the fighter command with such strength. Both sides gradually realized that the German enterprise had failed, and two days later, Hitler postponed Operation Sea Lion indefinitely. The impending danger of an invasion had suddenly become remote. After that, the RAF lost 1,547 aircraft, while the Germans lost 1,887. In a subsequent speech, Churchill recalled Weigel's prediction from earlier that year, stating, quote, some chicken, some neck. 
Thank you for watching our video. Don't hesitate to subscribe to Dark Seas and check out the rest of our Dark Documentaries channels to learn more about modern battles and technology. Also hit the bell icon to be notified of our newest content, and stay tuned.